Void was my first experience with the band, period. And uh, the rest of us had gotten together without Fred, and we met Fred at one of his outrageous parties that he had back in the day. It must have been <laughs> two, three hundred people packed in a small yard. Wow. And it was just wall to wall people. And Fred was drunk and he was wearing a big straw hat. And he didn't look very singer like or all that masculine at the moment. Somebody said, That dude sings. And we're all, no way, not that guy. And, uh, you know, then we met him, and after the party, he came and auditioned. And I guess Fred had done some singing prior to that in bands, but he still wasn't experienced enough to be totally confident, and therefore he brought, like, a, oh, I don't know, a case of beer or something like that. And I think he was so nervous, he downed, like, half of it, like, in no time. And so we were all worried that he was an alcoholic or something, which <laughs> ended up being a non-issue. And uh, you know he ended up singing for us, and we were we were totally blown away. And that was the start to working with Fred. Um, right around the time that Destiny's Void was together, Christian was in a band called Randall Flag. And uh, they were also prog rock, prog metal, I guess. You know, that the type of prog metal that was made back then, not now. <laughs> so it was a small community, you know, we all kind of intertwined one way or another. And um, I remember the two bands being kind of competitive. Um, I think it got started by Randall Flagg, but it doesn't even matter. It was, <laughs> we were young and stupid. second band ever was also with Fred and that was called Picture This so when Destiny's Void finally fell apart it didn't take us very long I think we had about a year hiatus and then we did Picture This and that was also with the drummer from Destiny's Void so it was three of us from the old band put together a new band and then I worked together with him for about six or seven years playing non-stop so I don't think I've ever worked with a singer as much as Fred to begin with. I've watched him go from having little to no confidence about his abilities to being able to sing really, really well and not have very much confidence about his abilities. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. All right. thrash band here in the small town of Antioch, California. We got the band together in high school. We met each other in high school actually before Say This. So me and John have been playing uh, the bass and drums for many different guitar players and singers throughout the town before we hooked up with the Say This guys. So, I mean, we're going back to teenage years, early, you know, high school, little kids. And practice in your bedroom. And we were exactly the same size then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and only your head. You probably grew into it. <laughs> Twenty-five years together doing Sadis, and we've kind of branched off and done other stuff together. Like uh, we did. Uh, well, back then we had uh, a couple projects with a couple different guitar players, you know, just did cover stuff, um, did a little bit of Maiden and Sabbath stuff back then. Oh, back in those days? Yeah. yeah. Played um, all the hot metal tunes of the time. Yeah. But I mean, even more recent, we did, uh, we played with Eric and did the Dragon Lord thing together. Did Dragon Lord? Did Testament together. And we were around back then, but we were like the little kid who was watching through the fence, you know. We were part of the history of Metallica, Possessed, Exodus, Testament, all that stuff. But we were just younger and less experienced to where we were just 
kind of riding in their wake, grabbing on their coattails, you know. Yeah. We put out a demo like every other band and, and shopped it and traded it and wearing fanzines. We thought we were doing it right, had a nice little following. Thought we contract was automatic and no one wanted to touch us. So we said, well, let's make a new demo, you know, after about a year of that you know, looking for a label. We made a new demo. I said, well, maybe the new stuff will impress them, you know. Made another demo, shopped around, yeah. same thing. Lots of fans, lots of recognition, lots of compliments, no record companies. Uh, we did all kinds of little projects at first. We would do, we did medical research at my mom's, my mom worked at the hospital. We went, we were visual <laughs> research, uh, test patients or something we did some some crap where we just had to test our reflex and we all got yeah. paid for that we threw the money in to pay yeah. for studio and covers and everything did darren get in like a car wreck that was the big and, thing yeah, yeah that's what he's referring to yeah, yeah. When, when just pitching in 100 here and there didn't work darren used his uh, freeway accident money his insurance money to pay <laughs> for our own album because after doing so many demos and not getting the offer we wanted we just said why are we gonna do a third demo let's just make the third recording our own album Pay for it ourselves yeah. and uh it was kind of fun man but i didn't ever want to do that again but after we sold our yeah. first 2500 copies we had enough money to press our second batch of 2000 albums and our first batch of 1800 cassettes so we were kind of modern at that point going vinyl and cassette with separate covers for each one you know <laughs> yeah. so you know that was the story of that and we had sold we were probably on about our I want to say fourth or fifth pressing of the album, two, four, six. Well, maybe about the fourth pressing of our album. Yeah. And the same box of cassettes, unfortunately. But uh, we had sold about that many when we finally got interest from three record companies. And it was just kind of like, what are you guys doing? Let's hear something new, you know, because you guys are selling your own album and that's all we want. So we went in and did a quick, quick demo at Fantasy with the. Uh, Michael Rosen. Michael Rosen, yeah. And yeah, he came out killer, man. We got a good contract for that. Yeah. Christian came back into town, and I guess he'd been here two or three years, maybe even longer, before he and I reconnected at Jeff Baker's funeral. He's a mutual friend, acquaintance. Um, Christian knew him better than I did. Uh, um, and we started talking about music and it turned out that Christian was doing this online metal um, radio show. One of the things I noticed on his show was he was playing a lot of metal. I thought I'd heard it all, you know. Um, the genres that I liked They'd stop making new stuff except for the same old bands like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. And Christian uh, was playing me all these bands that I'd never heard of um, that sounded strangely familiar because of their connections to the old stuff I like, but yet, you know, new and fresh. And so it kind of re... it, it breathed new life into my appreciation for metal because I had grown weary. Yeah. And now all of a sudden there was all kinds of stuff that I could chew on and digest. Christian, very quickly he noticed my interest growing in that genre of music again and said, hey dude, why don't we do some of this? And at first I was like, oh, okay. I, I, I don't think I was ever, uh, I, I think I was more neutral to the idea, but I wasn't negative. I, I hardly am ever negative about any kind of new idea. I like to mull it over and think about it. I see the world as a lot of possibilities and um, I didn't have any kind of notion of where it could go or what he and I could do together. In fact, to begin with, before I started becoming very creative with him, I let him bring ideas to me because I wanted to see the stage set first. I wanted to have an idea of what direction we were going to be moving in without, instead of just randomly moving forward. And so he came with the song um, uh, My Decay, or Your Decay, I always get Your it Decay. Up. Your <laughs> decay. My Decay, Your Decay. Our, deca our Decay. <laughs> uh, so, um, and that was the first song we wrote, and he wrote, you know, more than 75% of the riffs for that song. And at the time I didn't care because we were just doing something new and I wanted to see. 
And once the stage was set and, and I kind of got a vibe for what it was we were doing, I immediately became more creative and started adding a lot more riffs and then it became he and I together writing the riffs. I had never worked with anyone, anybody the way I had worked with Mark in that I showed up and he's like, well, what do you got? You know, let's write a song. Let's see what you got. So I'd, I'd play, you know, a few seconds of a riff and he'd go, okay, stop. And he'd fire up the computer and then he'd record, you know, uh, he'd come up with a drum machine part and then go, okay, let's record that. I, I, you know, I was always used to an environment where we wrote the entire song, we'd riff together until we had the framework and then we'd start recording. Christian came from much more of a structured background where there was a lot more preparation in writing before you actually recorded. And I had tried that school of thought, and it never worked for me. Everything sounded way too contrived. It seemed like it was missing a certain magic that the people that I really dug listening to, the George Lynch and Eddie Van Halen, and you know the people that obviously play off the cuff, like when they're recording. Uh, I, and I thought it was missing, so I got used to just hitting the record button and going, and then refining later. And Christian wasn't used to that, and so I kind of threw him in the pool. With Mark, it was, um, you know, let's, let's record every little piece and then kind of bend it around until it, it became a song, it took shape. And that was a great experience for me because since I had never done it that way before, I had never realized what kind of possibilities that opens in terms of, uh, of making the song interesting and giving it the character and depth. And I think he saw the light to what that kind of approach can bring, what kind of fruit that bears, and that's how we do it to this day. We also started off, um, Christian, for his wonderful abilities, is also pretty humble about what he can do. And I don't think he even realized how far he could take it in early on. And you know, at, initially he told me that I should be the one that solos. He has a, a skill set that I do not have as a guitar player. You know, he he plays a lot of uh, two-handed tapping stuff that I it is well beyond my skill set. I can't do it. first started working together I was going you play all the solos I, I you know you're a way better player than I am so one day he said here throw a solo on this I can't remember what we were working on and I recorded one and he goes no nah, that's it we're doing this together man we're both gonna play not just me you know and I was actually I was pretty happy with that because I had um, admired his work for so long I'm thinking wow you know the dude really digs what I do maybe uh, you know maybe I'm better than I thought I was <laughs> Playing the, the dual guitar harmony solo thing or, or the trade-off thing that Mark and I do was also just a matter of evolution. One of us would record, let's say, the first 10, 15 seconds or 30 seconds of the solo. Even if the other person had no idea what they were going to do before, now there was something to light a fire under their ass to kind of inspire them. Okay, this person did this, now i got to step up. And no fail, it always happened. So as soon as one person had a, a little bit, the next idea came very quickly. It wasn't really where you know we sat down and decided that that's what we were going to do. It was just, hey, I recorded a solo here, you go. Yeah, okay. So, and then the back-to-back -back thing worked out. Uh, lots of times we would sit down and within an hour or two trade off these little snippets and next thing you know we had a, a complete section done with interchange and everything. And lots of times that's what ended up on the album. We didn't refine it at all. Mark and I, on a production level, we don't always see eye to eye. This is one of those moments where Mark and I disagree on the number of counts.
And the fact that it sounds like we have a robot farting on the album. Johnny Five is alive with Future's End. <laughs> Seriously, man, cut it in half. Move that other swell. Move it back to the end of the part. It's perfect. <laughs> Mark, experimenting. Ever the producer. Ever the producer. Um, you know, I'll be like, dude, that is just not going to work. And he'll be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he sits there and he's focused on either playing or uh, production-wise, you know, in our studio on the computer. He's always doing something, and I have to wait for his, his vision, his audio vision, to uh, play out before we can decide you know, whether or not what we're working on is actually going to work in the context of the song. And nine times out of ten, it does. I Mark calls me up and says, hey, man, you remember uh, Christian Wentz from Randall Flagg? And I said, yeah. And he said, man, I'm, that guy has turned out to be quite a shredder, and me and him have been jamming, and we're looking to put a project together. And I said, well, sweet. I went to Christian, and I suggested, hey, we need a singer. Why don't we get Fred? And there was no hesitance on Christian's part at all. I think Christian um, had been a fan of Fred's voice, or at least knew that he could sing well send me some tracks you know and he said well um, we're coming out to Madfest in July and I'll just bring the tracks with me and you can check them out and see if you want on board so uh, they came out and man the tracks just blew me away they were just right right up the alley of what I was looking to do uh, it's been a long time since I've written any uh, um, original material Fred's a trip because when we're not working, he's always screwing around. Hey, Christian, <laughs> check this out. I'm not panning down, bro. <laughs> ain't gonna happen. Nah. Do it. It's a good one. Watch. And Fred's what? You just turned, what, 44, Fred? Yeah. I just turned 17. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Well, we're in our age on video. We're 29, goddammit. It. Right. It's like hanging out. You know, Fred, describing Fred would be like somebody hanging out with like a sixth grader. Really? You know, Fred's the kind of guy who will cup a fart and put it in your face and, and yeah, laugh his ass off or, when he drinks, or flick a booger at you. In. Flick a booger at you, and that shit's funny, too. And that shit's funny, too, he <laughs> says. Well, to Fred. Well, to, okay. In all fairness, yeah, it's funny to Fred. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what else? For that shit. Where's that? Uh, and then there's that. Oh, damn. Oh, oh it's uh, a boy. <laughs> Where's the animal? It's a boy. boy. It's a boy. Hi, my name's John. I describe Fred to people, because when they ask, I go, okay. Fred's the guy that when you're sitting next to him watching a ball game, he'll reach down and cup a fart and just reach over without you knowing it and just put it right in your face, and you won't know what happened until, until the biscuit hits you in the face. <clears throat> That's Fred Marshall. <laughs> And then we get him into the studio and it's, you know, he's always open to, well, what do you think of that part? And Mark or I will, will say, well, kind of change it this way or try this with it or, or whatever. You know, he's not so rigid, but he is a perfectionist in that anything that goes down as far as final, he'll like sing one line. He'll sing one part and, and then say, rewind that real quick. I want to hear that one note right here, that ah uh, part. And uh, I don't like that. Let's cut that one part again. And he'll just sing the one note until he's got it exactly where he wants it. You know, he, he knows exactly what he wants to do. When I get there. Now you said not, you don't like? Maybe. Yeah, listen to not. I feel so far away. Not too far away to say I'll be looking for you. Maybe it's just uh, the projection is the beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, right now there. nothing is compressed yet. Okay, next thing, so punch me after into the next line, please. It's funny too with Fred because, you know, I've known Fred uh, for about 20 years. You know, we played in 
in uh, the in different bands in the uh, late '80s, early '90s, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area metal scene that it was actually taking place back then. And back then, he was really kind of on stage. He was really kind of meek. He was almost like he was trying to hide behind his microphone stand. I, I did something to Fred, and I'll never forget this. And I still have people come up to me and talk to me about this uh, to this day. We recorded a show, and Fred did not move from that six inch square the entire show. So I, as I was playing, actually before I played the tape for him, I put two pieces of tape right next to each other on the TV screen and I said, watch Fred, push play. I said, you will never leave between those two pieces of tape. And he never did, stood right there. And, and we used to count how many times he would flip his hair too. So between the two, uh, I was giving him a pretty hard time back in the early days, uh, you know, but, um, but he doesn't have that problem anymore. But these days when he plays with us, his presence is huge. You know, he's got a really good command of the crowd and, and he knows how to talk to people in the audience and get people riled up and he's just got great presence. He also is probably the only one of us that doesn't make any mistakes live. We still didn't see the bigger picture yet. This was still mainly just a creative outlet for us. Yeah, just a concept idea that didn't have really plans of actually making the You know, when, when you love making music, you don't always have to do it with the, the prize, the brass ring in right. the future, you know, in sight. Sometimes the brass ring is simply f finishing something and saying, wow, look, you know, look what we did. You know, we've covered that you've known me, you've known Mark, you've known Fred, we've all worked together oh, yeah. in one capacity or another. What, what was your first uh, reaction when you heard that the three of us were putting together a band? Super group. first met Patty Man because I, my friend showed me a local band called Picture This. <laughs> Picture This. Picture This. I started having conversations with Mark. Uh, you know, let's hook up. Let's jam. Let's write something. Let's do an album. All that kind of stuff started coming up. You know how people always say, hey, we should get together and write some stuff, see what happens. So, I don't know, me and Mark had been talking about that for a while off and on. And we even had a couple attempts back in those days to hook up something. You know, we tried different material and different ideas and different visions. And, you know, we knew the potential was there, but nothing really stuck. We were kind of preoccupied with our our other stuff, you know. Got on the phone and I called Steve. Um, I don't know, it was a, I think one minute I was thinking, wow, we could maybe get Steve involved. And within five minutes I was on the phone with him. Anyway, I get a call from Patty Man. And he says, hey, Steve, you know how we've been talking about hooking up, making something musical? Uh, he goes, I think I got what you like to do now. He had actually called from Prague Power, I believe, or maybe the airport coming home from Prague Power one year. So you were still at Prague Power I was 8. still at Prague Power. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I think I was a little drunk when I called him. My enthusiasm was spoiling over a little bit more because <laughs> of that. And so I uh, I called Steve and, and I was all excited and I told him I was at Prague Power. I think he told me over the phone he'd been to one of those before too. And, and uh, uh, I said, dude, we got this new stuff, and Fred's going to sing, and I think you're really going to dig it. And Steve was totally open-minded. You know, I think he must have thought I was a little looped. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> um, I think it was the next day. I'm, it may have, I may have even emailed him, because I, I don't go anywhere without my laptop. Right. So I may have even emailed him that night and even got him to listen to it before we left Prog Power. I can't quite remember, but I know it was really quick. You know, after I called him, it didn't take very long for him to hear it at all. And his response immediately was, yeah, I, I love this. I'm, you know, I'd love to be on board. Well, Steve is, uh, I mean, I, he's Steve Giorgio. He's one of the most extraordinarily talented people I ever met. But he, 
you know, he goes well beyond his uh, obvious talents and skills as a bass player. He's uh, just a really incredibly smart guy to begin with. You know, he's into um, physics and astronomy, and he's got some real depth, you know, and um, hanging out with him is always a trip. He manages to crack me up on a regular basis. Give us some, uh, some Japanese shred. That's Chinese. <laughs> well, it's Asian one way or the other. It's funny because a lot of people know Steve as ex bass player extraordinaire, a rock star, and blah, blah, blah. I just knew Steve as some guy that was in our scene. You know, I, I knew, I, I played on a couple songs with him. He, he, uh, I rented the studio and he came in and played with me. I knew he could play well. He's one of the best play bass players I ever played with. But I think it was our, our personalities meshing that made me consider Steve my friend. He seems to work best under pressure. You know, if we have a, if we have a show to play, you know, and he needs a refresher on, on uh, the, the, uh, the songs and, and the arrangements. Um, he seems to work best when he's just two or three days away from having to play live and then suddenly he locks in and focuses and he's able to play everything. Um, but at the same time, the, the coolest thing about playing with Steve live is that, I mean, he recorded his parts and he wrote some great bass parts for the album. But when he's playing live, he tends to keep the framework of what he originally did but then he, he starts creating on the spot. You know, it's like performance art. As opposed to playing everything verbatim the way he recorded it, he, um, he, he makes stuff up as he's going along, and it's, and it's always awesome. And he also, you know, he's got this... Steve has this larger-than-life presence on stage. You know, he's a big dude to begin with. He's like, you know, 6'3", or 6'2", or 6'4", or something. I don't know, he's a tall guy. And he's got this monstrous bass that he plays, this huge, imposing bass. You know, and the dude always has his, you know, he always has his hair pulled back when he's not playing. He goes out on stage and lets it all hang down, and he's just like this, you know, this metal god. Awesome guy, great player, um, inspiring to watch, and I have no idea how he pulls off what he does without any frets. <laughs> okay. It's like magic. The magic man. So then Steve came over after we came back from Prague Power and uh, almost immediately suggested that we bring in John. Steve gives me a call, you know, he goes, hey, I got this project I'm working on. He's not really working on it yet, but he's got this music he wants me to help him out with. It's uh, progressive. He goes, I know you haven't done a lot of that stuff, but are you interested? And so, you know, I'm definitely thinking... You know, this is something that's a lot different than what I'm used to doing, but it it would be um, kind of cool to kind of expand a little bit, you know? A lot of people were trying to talk in our ear, too, when we, when we announced that we were going to use John, that we, what if John couldn't play progressive metal? He's a thrash drummer. The, uh, the description of John lately has come up that, you know, he's a thrash drummer and People had kind of second guessed his, you know, his contribution to this band, but I, I never doubted it. You know, this Mark and Christian are writing in the progressive style, and there's melody and all this kind of stuff that, that is not common in thrash. But you know, the music, I figured it was, you know, right in John's bag of tricks. I was doing a lot of the speed metal stuff. You know, it, it seemed like. You know, I was, I was working with Zetro a little bit on some stuff, working, you know, doing the Sadist thing for a long time, doing, uh, um, you know, working with Eric Peterson with the Dragon Lord, and, you know, it was, it was kind of, I was getting older, and it seemed like I was getting more extreme with this music, you know, and I kind of wanted to get a little more in the pocket and, and uh, play a little more, um, you know, with some odd times, and, and kind of, kind of, uh, kind of feel feel the art part of it, you know. All the way up until we went to record the drums, we really didn't know what kind of a job John was going to do. We took Steve's word for it. And uh, uh, I'm very, really glad that we did because John surpassed, um, I mean, me in particular, I can't speak for anybody else, but just my wildest expectations. So what can you say about Steve DiGiorgio? He is a phenomenal bass player, and him and John Allen as a rhythm section are just... 
untouchable. They're unstoppable. It's uh, they're undeniable in in their talent. And when I heard that they were on board uh, or that they were thinking about coming on board, I um, I was blown away. I was just like, come on, come on, come on, come on. I was hoping. I was crossing my fingers. And uh, when, it, when it was finally said and done and, and we knew that they were totally on board, it was just such a relief. And I knew that we had some, some awesome players that were going to be on the, um, the album. I thought it was a really good opportunity. And, and I told them, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. And, and I, I was real excited about um, warming up to the Future Zen stuff. And um, I mean, look what happened. He's, he's one of those, I don't, I don't think he, John could piss me off if he tried. You know, he, he's just a happy-go-lucky guy open-minded to everything um, definitely not a pushover about his ideas you know he'll, he'll he has strong opinions but um, in a very nice way <laughs> I don't know how to say it a incredibly talented um, charismatic it, it, yeah charismatic it's been a pleasure playing with him and getting to know him I, I, I feel completely lucky to have everybody that I work with and uh, welcome to another edition of Prog Snob Radio. I am Savadude. I am your prognosticator. I am the progtologist because I'm shoving prog metal up your ass all night. How y'all doing out there? It is Saturday night. You know what that means. It is definitely time. I was a DJ on an internet radio station for a couple of years, KWTF out of, uh, out of Texas. And it turned out that Christian was doing this online metal um, radio show and um, every week on my show I did a show every Saturday night and every week on the on the show I would um, play some of the demo material that we had with with or without vocals actually as the momentum for this project started going and as little things started happening to it um, you know the drum tracks and then the new solos and then some scratch vocals and all of that other stuff started happening he put them on he put all that stuff on the radio and the audience was allowed to listen to the evolution of what would eventually become uh, Memoirs of a Broken Man. Bass god Steve DiGiorgio has joined the band. Steve is a monster bass player, uh, played for Testament and Death and Iced Earth, and the dude's been all around the world. Just came back from touring with Sebastian Bach, a uh, highly regarded and respected bass player, is also playing with us, and... Uh, I, I just couldn't be happier about the music. So I'm going to roll this track for you right now. All of the songs, until actually Freddie wrote the lyrics to these tunes, were codenamed. And uh, this one's no <laughs> exception. Uh, this one is, I think we called this one Christmas Lowling. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm going to roll this one for you right now. Let me know what you guys think. Next week you'll be hearing this stuff with Fred singing on it. Right now it's just the music. But this is the latest from Future's End right here on KWTF The Edge. In the beginning, we were trying to get attention in any possible way that we could. And we didn't even realize what was coming. We didn't realize that we were going to get signed or even uh, you know, make a complete album out of it. At the time, we didn't even have a rhythm section. But uh, I wanted to uh, spread the word as best I could. And you know, having my own radio show was a great form for playing your music and getting it heard. And at first, I felt like, man, we're kind of giving away all the goods. But I think that the audience had a chance to kind of watch the band grow and develop. And I think that was a very smart move um, on uh, Christian's behalf to, um, to do that. You know, even though I was kind of anxious for people to, to hear it and get their reaction, I was also very reluctant to give away all the goods right off the bat. But it ended up being a good thing for the band, I believe. KWTF was instrumental to starting our little fan base that we ended up with people. The word got around. I mean, ori originally we, we couldn't come up with a name for the band, so we were called Remember Tomorrow for a while. And we decided we didn't like it and we changed the name of the band up to uh, Future Band. And right around that time we got John and Steve involved in the project. Um, either Mark or myself had played bass on all the demo stuff, and there was nothing but drum machine. But we played it on the radio pretty much every week, nonetheless. I mean, every time a song was written, um, we played it on the show. Actually, there was a few times where I played songs that weren't even complete. You know, it was just the first two minutes or whatever. I try and start some sort of a buzz. I think, you know, uh, there was some magic there, like, right away. In, in the way that when we listened to it, we were all, wow, it's pretty cool. And we wanted to get other people's reaction. So that was definitely cool. I think we, we started getting good feedback right away, and I think that was probably what propelled us into the direction of wanting to make a natural band instead of a project. I created the My 
MySpace page, I think in November of, uh, of that year, Lance King had called me up, having heard some of the demo stuff on, I think it was either on KW, KWTF or, or uh, MySpace page, and he said, hey, I love this stuff, uh, let me know if you want me to, to produce it, because I'm interested in the music. At that point, I called up Mark and Fred and said, hey, you know, Lance at Nightmare Records is, is uh, serious about uh, the music that we're playing. He's interested in it, so we really got to lock down and come up with a really solid product. Well, getting signed with Nightmare, that was a, um, Christian is responsible for that. I'd started tracking down Lance King, you know, he was doing Nightmare Metal Fest in, uh, in Florida. So I flew down there to hang out with him and, you know, keep up appearances and continue making noise for my, for my band. He is very much a social person when it comes to uh, contacting people in this genre of music and you know staying in contact and and being friendly and and, and, and you know looking searching for new opportunities um, Lance was doing Rocklahoma so I flew out to Oklahoma to go to the Rocklahoma thing and and continue making noise for the band um, you know between that and all the stuff that we did on on the radio um, and then eventually getting to a point where we were ready to start recording with John and Steve, um, interest was high enough to a point where Lance started taking us more seriously, I think. In the beginning, I was a little apprehensive only because I was used to coming from an era where no band could get signed without getting screwed. Things are different now. We're living in a new era, so that there are new types of deals being made. And there are actually labels now that are what I call artist advocates. And it's, you know, it, it wasn't that way at one time. And I'm really happy that it's moving in that direction. And I'm happy to say that I believe Nightmare Records is one of those advocates. companies. They, um, you know, I don't think we got screwed in our contract at all. It was, it needed to happen. There's too much talent in this group of people for that not to happen. And, and when, you told me that it did, it was great. I've never been in a sign band, really. I mean, I sang on a Zero Hour, a zero hour track um, album, but, you know, I never really was signed to a label, so it was kind of, you know, a first in my life, and it was a milestone that I was looking to hit at some point, and um, I'm glad that Lance is the owner of Nightmare, and he's been treating us really well, and I'm stoked to be a part of the label. Fred came in and started writing the lyrics and uh, and after, you know, six or eight months worth of writing stuff, he had pretty much two-thirds of the album done. And at that point we had, um, we had flown him out to record the first five songs, or the first four songs. And uh, they were, I think, uh, Share the Blame and uh, Stand to Fall, um, Your Decay was in there. There was, a, there was a few that were in there in those first uh, vocal sessions that he recorded that we made demos out of. You know, all the songwriting was basically done by those two guys. I pitched in a couple good ideas, but uh, they were just, they were going full speed and I had some other stuff I was working on. So I would just come in now and then and, you know, more or less give approval or not, you know, just, just kind of offer, you know, a little suggestion. But I didn't do any writing really on the first album, just pitched in here and there. In uh, August of 2008, we flew to uh, Houston, Texas, where we recorded the last of the, um, the vocals for the album. We did uh, Let's see, uh, Beyond Despair, Power Slave, Inner Self, and, um, and that's when Lance, we actually invited Lance King to come sing on the Inner Self track with Fred. So it's pretty cool that you have the owner of Nightmare Records also does a cameo appearance. Yes, um, oh yeah, he does some amazing vocals on um, Inner Self. Inner Self, and uh, it adds a different flavor and texture to what would have been just, you know, one flavor of singing. I think he was there a half hour and he laid all of his tracks in like one or two takes. Lance had flown into uh, Houston the same weekend that we were down there to do 
something with one of his bands at the um, at the Rock the Bayou Festival, and so he he was great, man. He he had done it was a Sunday, and on Saturday night he had uh, record, he had done a whole show with his band Decibel in Minnesota. Flew down to Houston on very little sleep, did a show with uh, Crucible at uh, Rock the Bayou. Then at about 1 a.m., uh, drove over to uh, Lucho Silva's house at El Studio Lucho and uh, cut the uh, vocal tracks that you hear on the, on the finished product uh, for Inner Self. At about, I think he finished up at 2.30 in the morning and then he flew home a few hours after that and he did a killer job. Let's. 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 Oh, I like that, the way you dropped down there, man. That was, that was sweet. All right, let's try it. This is Lance King. I'm on. starting to think that something different is probably the best route. This is Lance after four sets last night, one set tonight, and now it's 1 a.m. and he's recording with us. <laughs> it's 1 a.m.? Yeah. Don't Ooh. tell him that. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's <laughs> 1 in the afternoon, and... <laughs> let's, go. let's go! What are you waiting for? You can hear me now. Always good, symphony, I cry in vain. Wow. Your decisions affect both of us. Stifled voice without a name. I got wood. <laughs> yeah, for me, it takes me a lot longer to do that crap. But uh, he just came in, he knew what he wanted to do, and he did it, and it was done. And he was like, anything else? We were like, nope, thanks a lot. And he was like, all right, we'll catch you later. I'm forsaken, you're my savior. Lucho invited us into his home after never, never having met us before, except for in the internet chat room for KWTF. And the hospitality that he showed us was just amazing right off the bat. I think it was in April of 2008 that um, Mark had actually flown down to Texas to record with Fred at uh, Lucho Silva's uh, studio. And uh, th there they had done the tracks for Forsaken and uh, Relentless Chaos. And um, Lucho was there, of course. You know, we were, he was kind enough to not only let us use his studio but he always gave us a place to stay and let us use one of his vehicles to get around you know lucho was really instrumental in making this album work i don't know how we would have done it without his help let me go say hi to fred the janitor it's fred the janitor janitor fred well he's being laptop boy And here we catch up with Janitor Fred. Wow, that's cool, dude. What? I can appreciate making your space better so that, well, you Well, know. I'm actually doing it for Lucho, you know. He's got a record company owner coming over in a couple of days. He does? Lance King, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, Lance is coming over. So oh. you, you can see here at Future's End, we're not spoiled rock stars. You know, we don't have everybody, you know, we don't have a... We're not paying people to do our dirty work. <laughs> you know, this is this is actually proof that singer that uh, Fred does not have singer's disease. So yeah, and he also um, gave us the use of his studio because in the process of recording the album, since Fred doesn't live here, we had to fly Fred out here, and then we had to go to Texas. And um, Lucho has a studio in Texas that he let us use to record at least half the material. It's awesome. And um, you know, free of charge. And he put in lots of hours and helped us out. So, yeah, lots of props to Lucho and Magistral. We also asked him if he would join Fred on a couple of tracks, and he sang on Relentless Chaos and Forsaken and just did an incredible job. It was really awesome to hear what, uh, what they had done with Lucho down there. And for being such a gifted musician, he didn't have any of that uh, Stuck on himself attitude that you know the lead singer disease that some people can have. Lead singer disease. Uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know he he was just an amazing guy, 
uh, super talented, funny, but at the same time, um, doesn't pull any punches. He'll tell you the straight scoop. You know, if he would have thought we sucked and he didn't want to be involved, he would have told us. So when he, when we asked him to sing on it and he agreed, that was actually a, a good sign because if he would have thought it sucked, he would have said, no, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, I not- really like you. You're my friend, but you suck. John Allen into uh, Trident Studios uh, to record drums in December of 2008 and uh, he spent uh, probably a good 10 days in the studio with with uh, the engineer and the studio owner uh, Juan Ortega. Well you know Juan's a great friend um, that's not the only reason that I like to record with him um, he's uh, he's a drum guy he's worked with a lot of good drummers he um, kind of knows the communication as far as when you're in there struggling and there's a take that you're trying to do and you're not getting this take, Juan kind of knows where to get you to the next level. He can go, all right, you know, let's take a break. Let's, um, you know, let's work on, let's work on a different song, you know. And then he kind of knows when to take you back to that other song, you know, where you're, where you're missing a few things. Juan's actually a really amazing and very talented uh, engineer and producer. And uh, he, you know, his help was essential in establishing that big fat um, rhythm section sound that you hear on the album. And um, I think it's a comfort zone is what it is with Juan. Um, he, he, he could take it, he could get more out of you. You know, when, when you're working with a, an engineer or producer that knows you personally, they know the buttons to push as far as getting more out of you. From the beginning, you know, Juan was a great friend, so it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun going in there, and and, uh, and plus he's a metalhead, you know. <laughs> he, li- he likes metal drums. John did his drums in December, but I, I think that uh, it was several months before we got back in there. I think Steve uh, did his bass tracks in April of '09. We actually um, got all of the uh, tracks to start mixing in, uh, I think it was May of '09. <laughs> decision to mix the album ourselves after some scheduling conflicts arose. We were going to have uh, Trident Studios mix the record, but uh, Trident was really, really busy, and, and so unfortunately we, we couldn't get that coordinated, and we were just up against this incredible time crunch in order to get the record out. I think we just felt, you know, we, we knew our sound better than anyone. Instead of bringing someone in and trying to describe and always adjust everything, Mark pretty much mixed it uh, nearly himself. I mean, he took input from everybody in the band. Steve had his ideas, and John and I did, and Fred did. And we all worked very closely with Mark in getting the record uh, mixed and getting the final production and the mastering done. Mark would send me his most finished versions of each song, and I would burn them to disc, take them out to my truck, listen to them, and it was weird because I'd have, I'd like, you know, part from 122 to 144 is too loud, and then 144 to 148 uh, is is too quiet, and we just go back and forth, back and forth with each song. I've been involved in sessions before where you try really hard, and when you're done with the session, you know, you walk away thinking you couldn't have done any better, it's your best shot, and then there's something about it sometimes that just kind of irks you, you know, something you always want to go back and change. You know, you always go back and you listen to it and go, well, we could have done this a little better, or this snare might not be loud enough, or, you know, these vocals might be a little too loud, or or these solos weren't loud enough, or or whatever. But in the end, when I listen back to the record, I'm extraordinarily happy with it. And I gotta tell you, man, Mark was under incredible amounts of pressure to not only get this thing done on time, but make sure that everybody in the band was happy with the way it came out. And you know, he never even blinked an eye. He was he worked on it for I think six weeks straight or a month straight. He he just he focused and he got it done and he did an amazing job. But through it all, I think it, they did a phenomenal job, and I'm hoping that they're doing that that they end up mixing the next album. Thank you. 
Shane DuBose is the uh, promoter for the Thursday Night Showcase at uh, Prog Power USA. And um, when uh, Mark and Freddie and I were in uh, Houston during the last of the recording sessions there in, in August of uh, 08, um, Shane had stopped by and he, he heard, he stopped by the recording studio and he'd heard what we were doing and he looked at me and said, man, this stuff is amazing. You guys have to do my show. And so I, I honestly, I was scared to death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, are we going to get to practice? The only thing was is that we had never played on stage as a band together. Maybe we should just skip that question. Getting several months worth of practice in so that we were ready wasn't going to happen. I think that it was such a great opportunity that we decided we were going to make it work no matter what. And so I said, okay, man, I, I'm going to remember that you said that. I'm going to hold you to it. And believe me, I'm going to bug the hell out of you every single day until you actually announce that, uh, that we're on the bill. And I did. I texted him daily. I sent him email. I called him on a regular basis. I busted his chops. Um, for six months until finally I, I texted him one day and said, so when, when are you going to announce it? And he goes, okay, okay, okay. You know, we're announcing it in, I think it was March or February of 09. And, um, and that's how we ended up on the, on the Prog Power Showcase bill. Um, it was the first time that John had ever played live to a click. Yeah, I was definitely challenged by the click track playing live. I've never done it before. Um, and I'm not the one that's going to say no. Um, I was nervous as hell, and uh, you know I played the best I could, but I was pretty shaky throughout the first few songs. You know, it took me a while to settle in and find my groove. Believe me, don't let anybody ever tell you that you know they're not nervous to do something. Believe me, even the biggest bands in the world are nervous to go out there and go on stage. You know, they're still gonna have to go throw up or shit before they go out there. <laughs> you know, there's festivals for everything. You know, and and they for different genres, different styles, and this is this is the King Daddy Festival for uh, North America for our type of music, you know, for progressive metal. So it was a pretty big deal to be on it. I think for our first performance it went well. And it was a bit like uh, running downhill full speed in the middle of the night. You know, you just might make it to the bottom all right. I was amazed at the response that we got. Yeah. You know, it felt like we weren't doing nearly as well as how well we were being received. The, the, the crowd, <laughs> you know, they, they acted like we couldn't make a mistake if we tried. I was in the crowd and it was electric. It was it uh -huh. was very cool and being in the crowd. So the show went over really well. We we had uh, a really amazing response from the crowd that just kept growing uh, every song that we played. We had a we had a great time hanging out there and the, the camaraderie and the brotherhood was killer. And uh, I had I just had an amazing time playing on stage with these guys that I'd been spent you know that I'd spent the last couple of years working on music together and creating something with together. So that was it was really an amazing thing to be able to step out onto a big stage with great lights and a great sound and a huge crowd to play for for the first time with this group. About 15 minutes after we were done, we were sitting there, you know, trying to cool down, and we were all pumped up, and everybody's excited about you know, this and that, exchanging stories, what happened on stage, and uh, and Lance from Nightmare comes down and says, you guys better get upstairs and, and get to this, uh, the meet and greet table. Because we have a line that goes all the way down around the corner, I can't see it. We've sold 52 CDs in the last 20 minutes, so you need to get up there. And we kind of looked at each other, really? And so I ran upstairs, uh, Mark and I were the first ones up there, and, and Lance was right, there was a huge line by our signing table, and we got to take pictures with fans and sign autographs and sell CDs for, you know, a good 45 minutes. Um, and that was, that was just an amazing thing. I'm, I'm so glad we went over as well as we did, and that people love the music as much as they did to, to wait in line for us, even while the next band was, was on stage. So that was a really, really major thing, man. It was, it was great. Well, you know, all of a sudden you hear that, uh, you know, there's, I know you guys just got off the stage, you're all sweaty and stuff, but you know what, we've got, you know, 400 kids down here that want to get your autographs, you know, what, what do you say? Um, that, that's awesome, you know, because that's, you know, the first time you're part of a, a festival like this, you're like, you know, we got to get down there and meet some new fans and, and uh, get involved in it. I think it was an amazing thing. Uh, we tur turned on a lot of new fans, met a lot of people that night. I think playing Prog Power gave us a big head start. I'm, I'm glad we did Prog Power. It, it kind of kicked off, you know, the future of this band in the right direction. It's a total honor to play Prog Power. That's all.
month off after Prague Power and uh, headed back over to Chief Dog Studios where, you know, in Mark's house where we wrote uh, Memoirs of a Broken Man and started working on the new album. This is Chief Dog Studios where futures end, writes, plays, and records. This is where we wrote and recorded Memoirs of a Broken Man. Um, and this is where we're writing and we'll be recording our second album. And uh, this time, Steve is uh, far more involved in the process than he was uh, on Memoirs. And I think that the uh, music that you guys hear from it will uh, definitely reflect Steve's involvement. Well, last album, uh, I uh, wasn't involved so much, you know, I, I contributed, uh, I want to say, a few ideas. Steve is on board whenever we come and write, Steve's here with us, so it's, it's almost like a minimum of three people now instead of a minimum of two. But this is the first time I've seen three people get together and just, you know, stream of consciousness, just this goes next, this goes next, oh, that gives me an idea for this part. And it's, it's really cool that we can we can make things happen so fast like that you know where we can just come up with a what if we play this and within a couple minutes we're listening back to the you know a very well produced example of that what if and and uh we start rocking out you know and high-fiving and i think we're on to something i don't think we can look back and say this worked or this didn't work to you know to the extent where we're going to analyze it so that we somehow reproduce what we did on the first album. You know, one of the things that I don't want to do, I think the primary thing that I don't want to do is rewrite, you know, re-release Memoirs of a Broken Man. Why would we want to do the same album twice? We want to grow a little bit. And having Steve writing as much as he is on this, you know, he's actually, we won't actually have a writing session unless Steve's there. He's, he's an integral component to all of this. And as a result, the music has taken a, a slight right turn. You know, this is, is, I guess, what you call refinement. You know, we, we we're going, and, and when I say refinement, it's more in spirit than actual any kind of formula. We're writing together, uh, the three of us, uh, Mark, Christian, and I in kind of a, uh, it's kind of a feed off each other session. <clears throat> you know, we're in the, uh, in the studio writing parts and we just feed off, you know, someone will throw one idea down, the other guy says, oh, here comes what's, n here's what's next. And the third guy will fill in the next spot and we just go step by step like that, just feeding off each other, writing whatever comes whatever comes out at the moment. I wanted to make a heavier album this time. Um, you know, I think everybody says that, but I mean from the standpoint of, of crunchier, fatter, and louder guitars, and a much more distinctive and up in, the, up in front of the mix uh, bass uh, guitar. We're probably going to be moving a little bit more into the heavy, because we kind of, looking back, we saw that that worked and people really liked that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it's going to be any kind of conscious effort to this is how this new album should be. I think we're, you know, like the old one, we're just kind of like turning on the tape recorder and going. But you, the first one is, no matter how you look at it, will always be a lily pad right. to whatever we do from here right. on out. So I, I, the refinement, it was just a natural process instead of something contrived, I think. It's, it's really inspiring to to start with something with these guys and see it through to the end.